if you've come through a period of hurt, brokenness, mishap, why would you want to perpetrate that on someone else? Hi, this is Barry Phillips with 10 Minute Torah, day number one of the Torah portion Mishpatim. And it's in this Torah portion that Yah begins to break down line by line, facet by facet, thought by thought, all of the degrees of the Torah. It's in this portion, right after receiving the words, the Ten Words, what we call the Ten Commandments, the Father begins to instruct us as to how to live. Now, many years ago when I was a pastor, I pastored in my last church, matter of fact, I was looking for curriculum that would help me to teach my people how to live a righteous lifestyle, just some basic discipleship programming. And I looked through a variety of materials from a variety of publishers. Everybody had their angle. Everybody had their little niche that they tried to fill, but nothing really seemed to work. But it was while pastoring that last church, I began to study the Torah knowledgeably. That is, I knew what the Torah was and systematically began to study it and teach it. And it was in the midst of teaching Torah on Wednesday night in that local congregation I realized this is the discipleship program that I have been looking for. Here is Yah's heart. This is his character. This is Messiah's personality. These are the values that Yah uh, wants you and I to adhere to and understand because this is the lifestyle, the living curriculum that the Father wants you and I to model. Now, of all areas of attention that could have been given right after the giving of the 10 words, in chapter 21, we begin with the institution of slavery. Why not, why not parents and children? Why not business conduct? Why not governmental setup? No. Yah goes right to the heart right to the heart of where these people are, and he starts talking about slavery. Now, of course, America, as other nations, has had a dark and sordid past with slavery. It was ugly. It was wrong. It was uh, ill done, wrongly done. Uh, and thankfully, for the most part, we've come out of that, and uh, we've, got, we've got work to do. There's things that need to be improved. But the institution of slavery in America is no longer legal. That doesn't mean, however, that people aren't enslaved. Why would a Hebrew buy a fellow Hebrew? Why would one make a slave of his fellow brother? For the same reason that there are slaves in our society, in our generation now, because people enslave themselves. We're not talking about a race-oriented one here. This is not about the color of skin. This is about the conduct of life. A Hebrew may have uh, conducted his affairs in a very bad manner. He may have uh, brought himself to a level of indebtedness or allowed his, his uh, home or his family farm, his, his vineyards, to go into such a state of disrepair that there was no other option. I'm in over my head. I, I can't fix this. Anytime that we live on credit cards, you become a slave. Anytime that every little ache and pain sends us running to the doctor for another prescription, in a manner of speaking, you're becoming enslaved. When you live only for the appreciation, acceptance, and approval of everybody else without ever understanding who you are from the Father, to a degree, and in a way of thinking, you're becoming enslaved. We allow chains of bondage to be put on us from many arenas of life. In this instance, it is a Hebrew who has conducted his affairs and he is now badly, and he's now in debt. And there's only one way to get out of this. 
that is to sell his labor to someone else who will pay off his debt and then he has to work off that debt with the one who bought and paid for it. So if I'm in debt and I can't get out and you buy me, you buy my debt. You pay for my debt. In exchange, I'm going to give you six years of service. Now, during that six years of service, uh, whatever labor you prescribe for me, that's my job. That's my responsibility. But the hope is that as I watch you manage your affairs, as I learn how you move with skill and buying and selling and sowing and reaping and tending to the vines and, and uh, storing up for hard times, as I watch you work through your daily life, I should be learning the principles and the guidelines that would enable me to do likewise, so that the end of six years, I'm not just being shoved out the door and say, well, it was appreciated that you worked your dad off, but I need to be able to go and now meaningfully conduct my life in such a way that I don't end up in this situation again. How many times have we gotten out of one mess only to find ourselves crawling into another one? And it's because we haven't learned the life management skills that we should have. The Torah is here to teach us, help us to understand you're accountable, you're responsible. Everything that you put your hand to, everything that you make a vow to, to do or not to do, every promise that you make, every time you sign on a dotted line, in America, you know, we have situations where you have bankruptcy court. Well, I'm in over my head. I'll just declare bankruptcy and start all over again. That's helped people. I know of people that that's helped them, and they have stayed out of financial distress. After that, they learned their lesson. Sadly for some, though, it is a repeat, repeat, repeat cycle. This also helps us to understand another side of this. When someone is obligated to you and they're under your authority, when you invest yourself in helping someone to get out of their, their situation, you're accountable and responsible for them. I mean to say it this way, be careful who you put under your authority. Now, if you if you are the head of the home, you're a husband and a father, you are accountable. Your wife, if you are married, your wife may have skill sets that you use. I've heard people say, well, if you're the husband, bless God, then you got to handle all the money. Here in my home, my wife does a much better job of making sure that bills are paid, checks are written, and that the finances stay in order. She's got a better eye. She's got better acumen on that. She's wiser in that. She knows, you know, how to portion out the money and to get the job done. I approve and put that in her hands. I, I give some oversight. I give my advice and I give some direction. But she's good at it. Why would I take on that, which is her, her area of better skill sets and try to overmanage her? There are things that fall under my hand, and I need to be responsible for that. As a father, as a husband, you're my children, my grandchildren, I have some responsibility for setting example and setting boundaries and, and seeing that my family walks accordingly. When you have people, though, in your congregation that are under you, on your job, uh, in other areas of life, if you have people that are accountable to you, you have a responsibility to teach, train, equip, model for them. Whatever you're teaching them, you need to model that yourself. That's a hard one to swallow. But we need to make sure that we're giving good instructions. This is called maturity. This is called discipleship. This is talking about grooming leaders for our next generation. They don't just rise up haphazardly. We have to train them. we got work to do. And we got more tour to talk about tomorrow.
So we'll see you then. And until then, Shalom. Shalom.